Hello, everybody. So I've been growing the native plants for the native plant sale um, I, at least 10 years, I think a little longer than that. I also grow restoration plants for the um, Forest Service and BLM and sometimes for the tribes. Um, so I'm going to first go over because it's spring and everybody wants to get gardening and they're all excited and they want to, you know, and we're going to be in a drought. So we want to convert to native plants and get rid of our lawns because they take too much water and all that stuff. So before I go over the plants, I'm going to talk about a couple things you should be doing this spring before you even consider buying a plant or getting one for free. So you don't drive yourself nuts. The first one is um, do yourself a favor and make sure all the grass and weeds are dead in the area you want to plant before you start putting in native plants. Otherwise, you are going to be fighting that grass forever. And if you have a huge front lawn and, and it's Bermuda grass, um, you want to take your time, you know, choose a small amount of space and start working on that to find out how much work removing the grass really is. You're going to ask me, how do you get rid of grass? Well, you have a, four choices. You can dig it out. You can solarize it. Um, that's putting down plastic, you know, six mil plastic. You need to seal the edges of the plastic, leave it there all summer, and it will kill everything six inches down into the soil. Um, and then you can, you know, take off the dead stuff and plant into that. Try not to disturb the topsoil because all you're going to be doing then is stirring up weed seeds that are deeper down that'll then be happy to sprout. You can sheet mulch by laying down cardboard or thick, you know, like a good inch of newspaper overlapping and then put soil on top of it, plant into the soil. Um, I've done this. I did this on a house I had on Fowler Street where I put a raised beds on top of that. It was right in the middle of a Bermuda grass lawn um, and it worked great except and then but I had to continually round up around the edges to keep the Bermuda grass from coming in infiltrating back into the beds but it was a good way to go about it not quite so backbreaking or and if it is a um, Bermuda grass lawn uh, roundup works pretty well once you have you know, done the uh, herbicide treatment, you still need to let it die and then go back and retreat or, or chase what doesn't die in the first thing. And so the thing about, okay, when you're solarizing is if you really, you really need to leave it down all summer. Otherwise, this, I put this, so, this plastic down last fall in between my vegetable beds and you can see um, now that it's, they've done great. You know, the weeds are really enjoying their little greenhouses. As the weather's gotten warmer, they're starting to die, but um, I will leave this down all summer to make sure all the weed seeds are, are dead underneath it because I'm really tired of dealing with spurge. Um, so, then the next thing, once you're, you know, you've killed the grass and this is my front lawn or it was, I didn't water it for a summer. I solarized it for the whole next year. And then we, you know, then we, you know, raked off all the dead grass and everything. We lightly rotated till the, just the surface. Actually, we did that before we solarized. Um, so once it was solarized, we didn't disturb the surface again. And then we, you want to put in your hardscaping. So you're, if you're going to mound it, mounds of dirt, your rocks, your, your irrigation, how are you going to water your plants? We, I've seen two neighborhood local people in the neighborhood who had paid somebody to take out their grass and they put in plants, but no irrigation. And I'm wondering, oh my God, what are they going to do this summer? Are they going to hand water that all summer, which was fine. But if they put sprinkler on it, all that grass is coming back. So this was 2016 and this is a April, a year later, and then March. Um, and you can see that, you know, some of the, like these plants here got a lot bigger. 
And then over here, I can't see it because of the chat. <laughs> but um, yeah, you can see how much bigger the they've gotten in from between uh, spring and then into May. And then this is 2020. This year doesn't look the, the dandelions aren't there because of the lack of rain, but otherwise, uh, some of those other plants are even bigger. So my other piece of advice back here was do not overplant your space. Okay, you get the plants, they're small, but they will grow quickly and will seed volunteers. So save yourself a bunch of money and have a little patience. And what I figured in this garden, the average is six plants per 100 square feet is what actually is in the garden at this point in 2020, not what I planted. And a lot of in here, now I added a few more plants and a lot of them volunteered. So um, that, now you know how many plants you need to buy. The next thing about native gardens doesn't mean you put them in the ground and you ignore them. You do have to maintain a native garden as well. So this is the Denise's garden out at the research station in May. So things are starting to grow. The grasses are here. In December, she's <coughs> cut down the grass um, and you know trimmed back some of the bushes and cleaned it up. If you, let's see. No matter what you do, you have to maintain the weeds and you have to chase after the grass. If you've rounded it up, there's still grass in there that will come back. This is the community, our demonstration garden, native plants demonstration garden at the community garden and uh, we let it go to before we get in there and work on it. And so buried in all this grass here is a beautiful penstemon, um, but we didn't keep chasing after the grass. Um, we, it sits too long and then it gets out of control. This is a piece of weed cloth. It's that thick, heavy felt weed cloth. It doesn't work to stop the grass. You can see the roots here on this side and the grass on this side and weed cloth makes it much harder to pull out your native or your grasses once they get, they infiltrate into the bed or your, like I have weed cloth out at the station and then three inches of gravel, which works pretty well, although the grass still comes through. Um, but I also get volunteers and then I, you know, digging out those plants is pretty tough around the um, weed cloth. All right, so now we'll get on to the plants. So this is Chris Iverson's garden. And what I want to show you is um, here, right here is showy milkweed. Also, um, you're gonna see the, a different angle of over here on this picture. And um, so here, down here, you can see the showy milkweed in full bloom. But it'll bloom in the middle of the summer. It likes full sun, some water. If it gets watered, it will spread. Um, but it's a critical plant for the uh, monarch butterflies. And uh, it hosts a hover in spirit flies, which will prey on aphids and mealybugs. So as we're planting native gardens, we're trying to restore the ecosystems of, you know, the insects and the birds and balance in the life. So like the um, caterpillars will eat the, this plant bare, but it survives. It's, they've evolved together. So even though it looks terrible, it will actually come back if you get, if you're lucky enough to get some on. Monarchs. I haven't seen too many monarch caterpillars. This is seep monkey flower. It's, it's um, you know, flowers in the spring. It likes to have its feet wet, so it grows really well along the ditches or a pond, um, and it's host to butterflies and moths. Here's that picture, the other picture of Chris's garden where there's the um, milkweed again, but back here is Stanlia alata, and down here is what the whole plant looks like because it has a low basal flower and then it puts up these three foot three to four foot um, flower stalks that bloom in the uh, like around July and the bees boy the insects love those flower things this is Diane Petrosana's garden on Grove Street um, so we're going to be looking at the apricot mallow the lupin the cactus 
those are just poppies and some penstem in back there. Not actually penstem coming later. So this is apricot mallow. It's an early bloomer. It's blooming now. But if you cut the, if you deadhead the flowers, you can get a second bloom in the fall. It likes full sun. It's two feet tall. Rabbits and gophers love this plant. So um, if you have those problems in your yard, you need to make sure you cage it and like cage the roots, put, build a cage for the roots when you, you plant it in the ground so that the uh, gophers don't suck it under. Uh, lupin is one of my favorite plants because it's an evergreen, even without its beautiful purple flowers, you have a gorgeous bush that does have the nice sagey green all year. It'll get to three to four feet tall. Um, so the grizzly bear cactus is this light yellow flower. And then the other uh, Opuntia cactus is uh, back here, the pink one. It, grizzly bear is a fast growing cactus. The pink one is slower, Bacillaris. Um, but wherever, either one, you wanna make sure you put them out of walkways and kind of away from other things in the garden that you're gonna to have to mess with because otherwise, you know, it's, I'm trimming my lupin and I back into that thing and then my butt's full of, um, you know, pokes. All right, this is Stanley Pinata Princess Plume. And what's really nice, these are the ones out at the station is, you know, in March, it looks like this. In April, it's just, starting to go by June, it's in full bloom and it is full of all kinds of flying insects. The rabbits don't eat it, but the, um, and gophers, the rabbits and gophers don't like it, but the deer do. This is Lena Louisi blue flax that blooms late spring. It's two feet high, it likes full sun, tolerates watering, very easy to grow and it self seeds all over the place if it likes the soil it's in. So uh, purple sage, oh wait, I missed one, sorry. <laughs> Just the, this is a um, garden up in starlight and this is an eight foot tall fence back here. So I just thought this was a nice way to, you know, hide your fence and they just did a nice layout of making these big boulders and then tucking the natives in behind it. All right. So back to, this is purple sage, uh, it's, whoops, it blooms. Now it's blooming now, it's an early bloomer, um, full sun and it likes limited water. Desert peach, that is just finished blooming or towards the end of its bloom here um, in the valley. It, what it, the one thing about desert peach is it, well, it spreads rhizomously, so it will wander. All, you, know, you need to plant it someplace where you're gonna be okay with this bush. Um, spreading, but it smells great and it's beautiful and bees love it. This is water birch, a beautiful tree, one of my favorites, um, but it's it needs to be really close to the ditches and the water or someplace where it can get a lot of water. This is fern bush. Um, it likes full sun or it'll tolerate park shade, has low water needs, it's deer resistant, uh, and it grows to about seven feet tall. This is spiny hop sage. You sometimes the the flower bracts will be green, and other years it's red. And I'm not. I, I always think it's maybe the low water years that it gets redder. But um, it's a pretty little plant. It has these little thorns on it though, so it's not a cuddly plant. Bush sun. sun Flower. It needs full sun and very little water. Blooms early and then goes summer dormant. So towards the end of summer, the the leaves will, you go. Oh my gosh, my plant died. But it you know, and then it won't show any sign of life until mid April. So one to plant maybe a little in the back in your garden and put something in front of it. So when it does go dormant, you know, you don't have this thing right in the front that looks like it's um. <laughs> dead. So Helianthus and Tally um, is, it's a really tall sunflower with smaller flowers on it than the um, Kansas sunflower. And it blooms 
late in the summer into the fall. So it's a really nice bird feeder um, and good for the bees because it, it's a later blooming flat plant when most of the you know, early bloomers are done. So it's good for the bees and then the birds um, love the seeds on it. And it, yeah, you just have tons of birds flying around your yard. Desert willow will start leafing out once the free, you know, end of the freeze, like they're just starting to leaf out now. Um, and it, but it will bloom like full bloom until it freezes. And the bumblebees love that. And so do the um, hummingbirds. They'll sit and fight over the tree. It's pretty fun to watch. So now we're gonna get into the penstemons. There's lots of penstemons. <laughs> This is a rose penstemon. Um, this one grows really well up in starlight and um, swall meadows. It's a little hot down here in the valley. This is firecracker penstemon. Um, it does well down here. It will live a long time if you don't give it too much water. That's also probably true for Floridas. Any of the penstemons, if you overwater them, they will look fantastic, but they'll also blow up and they'll be gone. They'll rot out by the next year. Penstemon insertus is another really long-lived uh, penstemon. Has this nice purple flower and, and kind of thinner. It's not as tall. Penstemon pseudospectabilis is one of my favorite, whoops because it, it's huge. It will be, you know, it's easily three feet by three feet and three feet high too. Um, and it's this really dark green. So you have a nice dark green bush all summer, even after it's done blooming with these really nice magenta flowers. This is Penstemon palmarii. It really likes the lower valley, higher heat. Um, so good lone pine, um, like Bishop, south it, it's really good and in, into the um like low Inyo and that area the, now buckwheats are probably one of the most important plants for the insects because so many of them like the flowers this is california buckwheat it you know has this kind of not very exciting white flower but then those all turn red and then you have this red bush all year and especially into the winter um, looks really nice and right now um, it's just starting to open up with the flowers and I know mine in the backyard is full of aphids and ants are farming the aphids. I'm, I'm real curious. I'm waiting for the birds to get there and start dealing with all those aphids. Um, this is nude buckwheat. It has a low basal flower and you know leaves and then the tall um, but all these are super important for pollinators. So for buckwheat, it's blooming now. It's a low domey uh, plant and um, it's a slower growing one. California buckwheat is much faster growing than the um, sulfur buckwheat, but they're both very long lived and nice to have in the yard. And then this is Areogonum ridei, which is a nice ground cover. That's what the, so you can see it the little picture shows you what the plant looks like and when it's in bloom. This is in my yard and I took this for a couple of reasons. One, because it's a nice, this was early like February. So you had the sagey green of a lupin and then the dark green of the, um, this is uh, speciosis, um, showy penstemon. And then this is the Wright's buckwheat with last year's flowers which is the same thing as what California buckwheat does. So I just thought that colors there were really nice, even if it didn't have any current flowers on it. Um, and once it gets established, it sells seeds all over the place. So that's kind of nice. You get all these nice little low growing buckwheats. Corpanta confertifolia is a, you know, it's blooming now and it makes a nice border plant. It seems to die back after a year or two, but self seeds if you let it. And that's another thing. If you want birds in your yard, you have to let your plant, you can't deadhead them, you know, once the, the flowers die, you got to let them set seed. So then the birds um, can enjoy the seeds. This is rose four o'clock and it has extremely low water needs, it grows in the White Mountains and it will go completely summer dormant and die and disappear. 
and you think, oh, it died. And then the next spring, it starts coming back again. Then these are the Onotheras, the evening primroses. So this is the large evening primrose. It's shorter lived. It, it's like a biannual, but again, self seeds quite well. And then the creeping evening primrose, Californica, um, can get a little weedy. It, it really likes to spread. It spreads rhizomously and um, but they're both really nice. They open in the evening and they'll stay, uh, the flowers will stay open until the early morning and they have a nice scent. All right, California goldenrod, another important flower because it's a fall bloomer, but uh, it really spreads a lot. <laughs> so if you have a big space in the back of your lot that you need, you know, that would be, this is a nice plant. Otherwise, either containerize it or um, maybe consider something else because <laughs> it really does get pretty weedy. And it also, you know, all those flowers will turn to seed heads and it'll blow all over the place and then it will easily seed from, start growing from its seeds as well. This is a really, um, this is Pete and Roberta's uh, backyard out in Chalfont. This is not a lawn. Well, this is a lawn. There's grass there, but it's predominantly um, yarrow, which I've always thought would be a great ground cover. And that's a close up so you can see it's not grass, it's yarrow. Um, and they, so that's what the yarrow looks like. Normally, if you don't mow it, the flowers, I don't know, they're about three inches high. Well, no, and no, about six inches high. But uh, Roberta says if you mow it, they just get shorter. And so you'll, if you know, you leave it, you'll have a, a carpet of white flowers in your grass and you don't have to uh, mow it as often. This is California or desert fuchsia. Uh, it's one, another great one because it's a fall bloomer. Uh, um, if you water it, it will spread. So either don't water it too much or containerize it if you don't want it, you know, spreading to more places than you like it. But it's really good for the birds um, in the fall and the bees because, you know, it's one of the few flowers that is growing. And it, it has a really neat adaptation where it, it's, um, if you touch the leaves, they feel wet and cool. So which made me think, uh oh, you know, it's it's full of oils or something. But actually, they recommend it as a fire safe plant to plant, um, as opposed to one you like rabbit brush that you shouldn't have near your house because it's very flammable. So we plant the natives for the birds and the bees. But remember that the insects in the garden are important uh, uh, to raise a clutch of chickadees, it takes 6,000 6, to 9,000 caterpillars. And most birds, the most important insect for the birds are caterpillars to raise their young because they have, they pack the most protein and punch. So um, letting the bugs be on the plants is important to feed the birds and the other ecosystem in your yard. And yeah, these are just fun pictures. Down here, this little um, finch, these are the desert dandelions in my front yard. And what the birds do, they, they will land on the flower head or the seed head and it falls over and then they hold it down with their foot and then pick away at the seeds. All right, so now I wanna give you some resources. Um, so the first, people always ask me how much should I water my plants? And I found this one, it was really good. So you should water, a brand new plant you put in the ground, we'll water it once a day for a week, once a week for a month, and once a month for a year. And then the second year, you can imitate a wet year. So, you know, deep waterings in the spring, like in, um, maybe May and then July and October, or when, you know, if it's a super hot summer, then give it some water in the middle of the summer too, but, um, that helps it get it helps it, the first year is really important to help them get established and watering. So if I like my my gardens on a you know a sprinkler system, 
you want to water deep, like 45 minutes with a drip irrigation, you want that water to go deep into, and then don't water as frequently. And that forces the roots to chase the water deeper into the soil. Um, and that's what we want. We want them to establish really deep roots. Okay, then on the bristlecone website, if you go, this is a, our homepage, you go to plants, and you go down to native plant sales and it comes over and then there's a plant sale database. You're going to get this plant list. Now this is Maggie's list, Maggie's our webmaster. And so she has a, a whole list of plants that grow in the Inyo and Mono counties. Um, and here in this column will be how many plants there are available at the sale or after the sale or anyway, whatever. But what people get confused about, she has plants that grow in this area, not necessarily plants that I grow for the sale or are available or would even be good plants for the garden. Um, they're all the plants and also then included in the list is the ones that are for sale. So, um, but I have people coming to the sale sometimes who see that and they, they want one of those plants that I have never grown. Um, so, Back on the home page, this is our current home page, what it looks like right now. And so, you know, here's today's meeting. And there, on the from the 10th to the 14th, we're doing the online plant sale. So on the 10th, May 10th, we will post on our web page here and our Facebook page and on the Land Trust web page, the ULR for the um, store will go live. And you can go on and you know choose your plants and pay for them. And then you'll pick up will be on May 15th, Saturday. Um, and preferably you will choose a morning time so I don't have to be out there forever. Um, and if you click here down there at the bottom, it, it will take you to this list, which is um, gives you a little more information about the plants as far as how they are in the garden, whatever, and the numbers as of the date. Um, and those are just the plants that are for sale that are ones that I might grow, but I, you know, I don't have any this year, but hopefully I'll have some maybe in the fall. Anyway, these are all plants that do get grown for the plant sale. Also from that, this homepage, down at the bottom, there's the annual plant sale. So, and that will also take you back to this. That's another way to get to this list. If you go to back to the this, uh, the bottom of the front homepage and click on the annual native plant sale, you get to this page. Lovely Sarah smiling because she's so happy about her thing. And that's where it will have um, the list of what plants are available. But at the bottom of this page, there's this little native plant landscaping guide. And that was actually put out by the state um, office. And so this isn't, <laughs> It's a folded up thing so you can download it and it has like garden plans and then it also has a plant list of plants that are um, you know available. So then what I want to show you how to do, let me see, how do I share my I want to switch to um, Safari. Am I doing this right? Yeah, so I think just exit out of whatever tab and it'll okay. show your screen of where you're at on your computer. Okay. So you can okay. click so Safari. Going to Calscape. So are you guys seeing that Calscape now? No, we still see your. All right. Marty. Okay, what do I have to do here? So maybe go down to your Safari. Are you seeing Calscape? Um, I was a minute ago. Okay. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll do that. Okay, so go to Safari and choose Calscape. Okay, I have Calscape up on my Safari. Um, oh, it's a new share. Yeah. 
Katie, stop sharing and then share the. Oh, okay. Oh, I've got to stop share my other one, huh? Yeah, stop share and then reshare on your Safari screen. Oh, okay. Let's see. Uh oh. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> It's, a, it's still not working, is it? Hold on. Um, stop share. Right, now share screen again. Okay. Safari window. Okay. Now, what are you guys seeing? Not yet. You Did you push the share button? Uh, ta -da. There you go. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so this is. <laughs> Um, this is a great resource. Uh, it's Calscape. It's put on by the Native Plant Society. And there's two ways. So if we go into this one and we type in, um, oh, I'll do Achillea. Oh, I'll show you that I can't spell. Um, what if I do, what's going to show me Aro? And then it will not help. All right. You can do, <laughs> if you know how to spell, here, we'll go to California Fuchsia, then it will click on to um, a, the plant. It shows you where it grows in the state. Very wide ranging. It gives you details about it, its description, where it grows, all that stuff, the wildlife it's supported, what it, you know, full sun, low moisture, carried by a lot of nurseries if you need to find, you know, I don't grow a plant, I do grow this one, but if, if there's a plant I don't grow and you want it, this is a place you could find a nursery that might carry it. Um, so all kinds of great information. The other one that is pretty cool about this, if we go back to, oh, I know what I did. You should put the name of the plant up in this search, Bar. If you, we'll just do this, type in an address, it gives you a plant list of plants that grow in your area. And th this is pretty specific, like we can put, um, oh, what did I put? Well, starlight. and it will put, tell you plants that'll grow. The thing about this list is, um, again, it's kind of like Maggie's list, like, do, you know, would you really want to plant rush in your yard or Baltic rush? It, it's all plants that grow in that area, um, not just plants that would be great in your garden or you can get, but so that, yeah, that's a pretty cool, um, you know, and if you want to know about butterflies, butterflies that are native to starlight. <laughs> All right, so my last thing, let's see, now I have to go share my screen again, right? Uh, do I have to unshare my other one? Nope. Okay. So the last, my last slide was some um, references. And the first three, four, uh, the Fremontia article, Las Politas is a great website for plants. And also he has some really good things about fire. Um, and then these two, the choosing plants for Nevada's high fire hazard, which applies to us and the Savannah, Sierra Nevada Yard and Garden. These are, were actually hard copy books that now you can download um, online that are about, you know, which plants are good for fire hazards and how to plant and that kind of stuff, which I think we're all kind of paranoid about now. I am. Um, or here's some deer resistant plants. And then, so calscape.org I showed you. And then CMPS has a YouTube channel there. They busted out a thing called Naturehood. If you do that, you know, CMPS Naturehood, you'll get uh, their video, one hour videos of um, different garden tours, but they have a lot of other really good videos in there. 
The, my caution about some, especially the garden tours is they're for the west side. We're not in the California forensic province. So some of their advice does not apply to us. Like they, um, they keep talking about, you know, oh, put a, they, they overplant their yards, I think, because they want to shade, shade the soil so that it doesn't do um, weeds. Well, our, that isn't how our plants grow. If you go out and walk in the desert, there's space between our plants and that's how your garden should be as well. Okay, so time for questions. Yeah, so go ahead and if you're comfortable, you can unmute and ask a question or if you throw it in the chat, I can help. Um, with, or Katie, you can read that as well. Can I just? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have a question. The ceanothuses that are native around here, no uh -huh. got them. I have never been able, I I have not taken the time to learn to grow those. Um, oh. I think I haven't been able to grow them from seed. I think I need to try and do it by cuttings. Um, one thing about ceanothus, if you get them, I mean, I think you can get them at nurseries. No, um, you can't. I mean, I can't find the kind that I'm looking for. Okay. So uh. what are some cultivars that the nurseries would have? Of? Oh, I'm, boy. Are you looking for like white thorn and uh, what's the other one? Leucodermis and uh, Grigii, which are the two that are native to our area. The two that are native and Calscape listed for nurseries, you know. Uh -huh. None of them had them? Jane and, you know, and none of them have it. Oh. <laughs> and so, so I'm going, what similar would survive around here that's not quite native? Uh, uh, you know what? Can you send me that as a question as an email and I will do uh, ask my friend who had ceanothus. The, the thing about ceanothus here, and this is true for manzanita, do not water them in the summer. You will kill them. Yeah, it, it, it's weird, but it burns their roots. Um, I'm putting Katie's email in the chat here. And um, I'm also going to, after this, I'll send out to all of you a plant list that Katie has um, created a spreadsheet for this area. So I'll also Yeah, so that. I went through using Calscape and then other lists that we have, detailed lists for neighborhoods and um, just clicked off the plants that would grow that I sell. So that list is plants I sell um, and then, you know, depending where you live, Will they grow in your neighborhood? Hey, Katie, this is uh, Stacy. Um, hey, Stacy. Hey, how's it going? Good. Uh, so, and there's, I see you. See, there. Over here. Yeah. There, yeah. Right. Um, t tell us again about like um, lupin and, and specific soils. Lupin, bush lupin seems to be kind of a, 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 a tricky one uh, to, to grow. So is it true that you need like the specific like the uh, soil biota for lupin or is that just a Yeah, method? lupins have, need a certain rhizobium to grow with, you know, like most beans, they like to be inoculated with that rhizobium and for lupin it's specific. So like the most success I have with lupin now for growing is I have lots of it volunteer in my yard and I dig those volunteers up because they are I you know assume they have the rhizobium with them so if you want to uh, get some growing try and dig a little bit of soil from underneath a lupin plant and take it home and put your seeds in there um, but it's also you know there isn't lupin where you live Stacy do you see it growing up there it's it's yeah you tell it's in the it's in the waterways, right? There are there are two different species that grow within about a quarter mile of here, but yeah, there's nothing that grows in this this little basin it's here. Matter. And I I I just sorry, Stace, I just don't think we have the right soil for it. Yeah, <laughs> too drainy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think you're trying though, you know. Yeah. 
right about it, it seems four to years. Grow, it seems to grow in, in um, spring and meadow areas. The um, I think we have Father Crowley's lupin, and I'm blanking on the name right now. Um, but yeah, yeah, we we just have this this gravel that sucks the water right out, and and um, yeah, alluvial fill. Oh, that used to be a meadow. So, um, oh, and then the other one is, is that, would you mind uh, um, sharing your slide deck? Um, your, your PowerPoint slides? Yeah. Do you want me to send you the whole PowerPoint? Yeah. Yeah. I missed the first about five minutes. Okay. Well, um, Gabriella recorded it too. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I can send out the recording. And then um, I believe Christy just asked for... Um, the web resources as well. So I'll, I'll do all that in a, in a big I'll old send you an email, email, Katie, and you can okay. send me the PowerPoint deck if you like. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, and so I figured with the resource, that last resource page, that because it's on, you know, it's been recorded, people can go to flip to that and... <laughs> But yes, I will send you the PowerPoint. Um, there are a couple questions in the chat. There's, um, can you divide a penstemon? Um, from, from oh, I've never tried. I, I, you know, the one, I, when I'm moving native plants around or digging them up, they are small. Um, I like lupin bigger than this. I have zero luck because by, you know, by this time, their root is at least twice as long as that. And that's true for all native plants. They grow really fast, deep tap roots. Um, that's how they survive. And so, yeah, trying to take an adult native plant and move it is pretty tough. Okay, and um, then so I've never tried to divide a penstemon. <laughs> and then um, there's another question that says, um, does indigo plant do well in gardens? Um, this person came in. There, um, so. I have it in my front yard. It's another plant. Don't what you don't want to. I never water it. You ignore that plant. Same with rice grass. Um, if you water it, you'll probably kill it. It's a hard one to get started. Like I planted 32 seeds and I have three plants growing right now for the fall sale. And I'll, oh, I'll give you guys a tip about the sale, Monday sale. Um, there is not a huge inventory. Uh, we did really well in the last year's fall sale, so there wasn't any plants really to carry over. So if you want plants, you want to get on early on Monday morning to order. Um, any tricks to getting purple sage to survive? Um, not that I've found. And I, I have a lot of purple sage this year for the fall sale. Hopefully it will survive that long. I, I think it's a plant that, again, doesn't want a lot of water. Um, but, I, you know, boy, in my backyard, I have one that's really old and it does great and it doesn't get watered. And I have two right next to each other. One's doing great. The other one is looking pathetic. Um, <laughs> so I haven't found the, the trick yet. Sorry. Um, I actually have a question. I went to someone's garden last week and they have a bunch of shade, um, almost full shade and a moment of sun throughout the day. So what would you recommend for that? I think they're pretty stumped with um, what to put in the ground and right. what, what um, would do well. The yarrow survives shade and um, uh, Oh, dang. The little lantern plant. Uh, I just forgot it. Name. Just a sec. Where's my plant list? Um, Jim Robertson, who used to, you know, do Sierra Gardens. That's one they recommended. They thought that was the, like, they, their opinion was it's the only one. 
to use. And, and what I'm trying, I mean, I haven't done a lot of cuttings um, and they say it's, if you get 30% success, you're doing well. So is, um, you know, the little plastic containers, the broasted chicken comes in from Smart and Final, makes really nice cutting containers because you can fill the bottom with the perlite and then it's got a big domey top for, um, yeah, I'm trying some green, green ephedra right now because that isn't an easy one to get to go from seed. Um, elderberry, so, you think? Yeah, I would try elderberry because that's another one I haven't been able to get to go from seed. <laughs> Dreams. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I lost a uh, connection there, and I guess that's just the default of of Zoom meetings. But um, did you find the, the lantern plant? Yeah, it was Columbine. Columbine. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and there should be like a on the cowscape. There should be a a shade section, right? I know there's like ground cover and like different yeah, types of, I think okay. Would, yeah, try that too. Okay. Um, Sounds good. Yeah, I found that useful. A lot of categories. Yeah. What time on May 10th does the sale start? Well, it, it depends on the state office and when they, you know, turn on that that website so I'm saying you know start start trying at eight I'll try and have them have them turn it you know turn the store on at eight because the last sale you know <laughs> I went and I fought the regular time and nothing was left <laughs> oh, yeah we didn't have a great inventory last I I will promise you we'll have a much better inventory of penstemons this fall but not the spring Um, somebody asked, what's my, um, uh, what are my tricks for stratifying seeds in the fridge? Um, so it depends on what the seed is. Yes, I stratify them in the, in the fridge. Um, they, but each different seeds need different stratification signs. Some of them don't need anyway you know need any uh stratification there direct others you need two weeks other up to 12 weeks so i i put my seed if i'm going to stratify them i put them in a little snack ziploc and i like i don't know it depends how many seeds i have in there a teaspoon of seed i would put a handful of damp perlite so like if you squeeze it it's not going to have water come out of it it's not real wet mix them up really good and then um, yeah, they sit in the freezer, I mean, in the refrigerator. I start some stuff in December and it goes all the way through um, March, depending on the seed. So penstemons take, um, I put them in like beginning of January. Paintbrush, I can't remember what paintbrush is. is eight weeks. And the thing with paintbrush is it, it is a hemi parasite. So, um, and so far I have only had success with um, one paintbrush where it came back the next year. I've only had two paintbrushes happen at all. I, I am trying to get, right now, I think I have nine going with the sage, but so I grow their partner plant and then I add the sage seeds um, to one year old partner plants. So right now I have red sage with um, year old sagebrush. No, wait, I, have, I, I said that right, right? Paintbrush with year old sagebrush. And do, you plant, I do you plant the sage first and then yeah. you start the, the paintbrush and next to it? And then a year later, I add the paintbrush so that the sage is big and strong enough to handle the parasitic behavior. And, and what I have that's worked in my yard, I have tall paintbrush down on the river. It's like, I don't know, it's three to four feet tall um, and it's orange and it grows with rabbit brush. And we all know how huge and out of control rabbit brush can be, right? Well, my rabbit brush is two feet tall, 
because the paintbrush is definitely parasitic on it and controlling its growth. And what was real exciting this year is it moved and I have a second paintbrush, so it's rhizomas too. Um, and it's over living with the hops plant. So I have two paintbrushes now. It's very exciting. <laughs> is, there, is there any other um, hemiparasitic or parasitic plants that, uh, that are, 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 are easy to do that with? I mean, pine drops or? Uh, I have a, I don't know, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you ask such hard questions? It's very intriguing uh, on the uh, sequencing on the paintbrush. Yeah, well, so I did it. I mean, I did it before with a red paintbrush and a sage and I, I was so excited because I got it to grow, but then it never, the paintbrush didn't come back the next year. And I kind of suspect paintbrush seed needs to be fresh, like collect it this year, stratify it and start it next spring. Yeah, don't wait don't hold on to it for a couple of years um is your the the river paintbrush that you grew is that picky about which species of rabbit brush i don't know i you know i just have um cryo or uh, nauseosis so that's what it and that's what it's growing next to down there yeah I'm not trying that this year <laughs> it's not i guess it's not too picky because it, it's gone over and paired up with uh a hops <laughs> so okay yeah <laughs> and maybe it's it's also pulling off of a, a domesticated sage you know a culinary sage that's nearby we we have a, a local meadow paintbrush it, it is the the river paintbrush that grows uh -huh. well um but it seems to specialize in the rabbit brushes in a specific meadow. So I was wondering, wow. we don't have that particular rabbit brush, so. Huh, well, maybe we should try some of your rabbit brush and your paintbrush, that would be fun. We're yeah. gonna get, we're, I think we'll gather some paintbrush we'll seed this year. year and see what happens. Yeah. How about, how about a, um, a, a quick primer on seed gathering? When um, do you go out and uh, on your forays and, and, uh, and gather uh, seed? I just get, I just, um, it's when I'm hiking, although this year I am kind of starting to, well, I make a list of seeds I need that I'm out of. I mean, I have a huge tub of seeds, right, that I've collected over the years. Um, so I keep track of seeds I'm out of that I will need. And then when I'm hiking, I'm making notes of what, I just went up Big Pine Canyon the other, last week, and there was coffee berry and desert olive on this one road and it's like, okay, I need to go back there when those, about the time those seeds will be ready. And like with desert olive, you have to, boy, you have to be on it because the birds, you know. And that's the other thing, you know, <laughs> I was gonna collect grass seed out at the station for uh, Sparabolus aroides and I was, oh yeah, I gotta get that. And then the wind blew and I went back the next day and it was all gone. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's, it's more if I see it when I'm hiking or if I'm making a conscious effort, but it, and it depends. It, each, see, each plant's different. To be truthful, I'm lazy and most of this stuff is in my garden and that's why I plant a lot of these plants. So I can just go in the backyard and do it. <laughs> Self harvesting. Oh, there's such a demand for bitter brush that you know, the, the bitter brush seeds are always the the uh, hot item, you know, to try to repopulate some landscaping and stuff. So I've been trying to figure out how to like, you know, what is the right time to kind of harvest some bitter brush seed locally? Uh, yeah, and I'm lucky that the federal people give me the bitter brush. Actually, I've really struck out on getting that stuff to grow the last couple of years. So I'm not sure yeah. why, but. And all of ours has little holes in it. It's always been um, dated. <laughs> Yeah, that's, um, somebody's asking what phone number for spring plant sale. Uh, I, what do you mean what phone number, Tom and Sue? Do it, you know, my phone number? Actually, I prefer if you email me. <laughs> Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Um, I just, you said to start calling early, so I wondered I uh, were new oh, to the year. Oh, oh, I meant go online and see if the store is up. Okay. And and that that or no, actually go 
on our website or land trust website and and click on the URL, which should be uh, see if the, the URL is there. Um, okay. I would uh, and and see if it works. Okay, that's what I meant. Um, also, song does the Elmas Cinerus, the Great Basin Wild Rye, does that do well here? Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, it's a beautiful bunch grass. I have a couple in my yard. Okay. Um. Thank you. And the sulfur areogonum umbilatum. We're, we're new. We just moved into the highlands and I'm oh, okay. going to put a, a few plants in. Does the sulfur buckwheat do well? Yeah, it does. And it's um, if you go for a walk out, out and about, it should be just starting to bloom. Okay. It's blooming in my yard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. I live on uh, Irene Way off of Bar Barlow, and if you drive by my house, you can't miss it. It's the only one that doesn't have a lawn in the front yard. Um, oh, bless you. It is in full bloom right now. You know, because, yeah, we're staying with uh, my husband's aunt, um, Rachel Lober. Oh, uh, okay. I know so, Rachel. Yeah. Rachel's a good yeah. We're right down the street, so I'll walk by and take a look. Oh, wait, Sue, I met you. We You're from did. Visalia, right? Used to be. Yeah, we we had dinner together at when we did the chapter council up in Levining. That was fun, and you were leading the hike up by your cabin at Virginia Lake. Yeah, no, I wasn't leading it, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, we did that hike. <laughs> Hi. Hi. It's we come on we, by, we, knock on my door. <laughs> okay, I will. We've only been here two weeks, but we're loving it already. Yeah, it's a good time. Not too hot uh, yet. Is, okay, well, unless we've we've taken to walking in the mornings down to the gorge. What is the paintbrush growing? Oh, God, I don't know. The dark green leaves? Okay. <laughs> there are so many different paintbrushes. <laughs> I know. I did not even try and key it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. So I think maybe we'll wrap it up um, since we're a little over, but I just wanted to give some time because there are some good questions there but um yeah thank you katie that was really helpful I'll, like i said i'll send everyone um these resources i i apologize if i sent the link a little late to some folks um i will send you the recording as well so just look out for that and yeah i think i'll cc you katie in case anyone wants to get your email Okay, um, and there, you can always okay with you. through um, plant sale, you know, the bristle cone thing and the plant sale that comes to me. You're welcome, okay. everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, and have a beautiful rest of your Monday. <laughs> Thank you.